Welcome to History Files. We're stepping back in time to explore a powerful chapter in South Africa's history, specifically the 20th century. It was a time marked by a fierce battle against something called apartheid, a grim system of racial segregation and discrimination. Yet, within this struggle, we witness the incredible resilience and leadership of some outstanding people and groups who stood up against this unjust regime. Today, we're focusing on South Africa's journey through the 1960s, a decade where it wrestled with political, economic, and demographic challenges while living under the shadow of apartheid. Imagine living in a country where laws are designed to segregate and discriminate based on skin color. That was apartheid. It was introduced by the National Party when they came to power in 1948, and it heavily favored the white minority over the black majority who were stripped of their basic civil and political rights. One of the major flashpoints of this era was the Sharpeville massacre in 1960, when the police opened fire on a peaceful protest, killing 69 people. The shock waves from this tragic event led to the government declaring a state of emergency, banning opposition groups like the African National Congress, ANC, and arresting key figures like Nelson Mandela. In the economic sphere, apartheid created massive inequality. Wealth and resources were piled up in the hands of the white population, while the majority of black South Africans lived in poverty. The economy was heavily reliant on black labor, who were stuck in low-paying jobs and weren't allowed to form unions or strike. Internationally, countries started to take notice of what was happening, which led to economic sanctions and isolation that hit South Africa's economy hard. On the demographic front, non-white South Africans were forcibly removed from their homes and resettled in designated areas, called homelands or townships, due to the Group Areas Act of 1950. These areas were overcrowded, under-resourced, and had poor living conditions. The government also used pass laws to control where black people could live or work. They created areas called Bantustans for the black population, which were generally overpopulated and lacked resources. These factors brewed a storm of resistance within South Africa during the 1960s, and led to global condemnation of apartheid. So while it was a challenging era, it was also a time that sowed the seeds for the eventual downfall of state-sanctioned segregation. Now it's time for us to take a closer look at two heavyweight organizations that played key roles in this struggle, the African National Congress, or ANC, and the Pan-Africanist Congress, AKA the PC. First up, we've got the ANC. It popped up on the scene way back in 1912, initially playing it cool as a moderate group that hoped to improve black rights through constitutional methods. But as apartheid ramped up its intensity, the ANC shifted gears and became more radical. This change was largely influenced by the formation of the ANC Youth League in the 1940s, with future bigwigs like Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo at the helm. They championed more direct action against apartheid, and their influence led to the ANC's adoption of the Program of Action in 1949, which marked the beginning of a more confrontational approach. And it certainly made an impact. The ANC organized a ton of protests and campaigns against apartheid laws. One standout moment was the Defiance Campaign in 1952 a bold act of non-violent civil disobedience against apartheid. The Sharpeville massacre in 1960 led to the ANC being banned, but it didn't stop them. They formed Umkonto We Sizwe, their armed wing, and continued to fight against apartheid, both at home and abroad. And it was worth it. The ANC played a huge role in ending apartheid and ushered South Africa into a new era of democratic rule under Nelson Mandela in 1994. Next, let's chat about the PAC, 
they broke away from the ANC in 1959 and opted for a more African nationalist approach, focusing on the need for black Africans to lead their own fight for liberation. They leaned heavily on the concept of Africanism, embracing the shared cultural, historical and racial ties among all people of African descent. The PAC aimed to rally the black African population around their more radical ideology. They sought to reframe the struggle against apartheid as an anti-colonial fight by Africa's indigenous people against white domination. And they certainly left their mark. One of the PAC's most notable actions was organizing the protest against the pass laws in Sharpeville in 1960. This is the same protest that led to the Sharpeville massacre and a wave of international condemnation against apartheid. Just like the ANC, the PSC was also banned after Sharpeville and its leader, Robert Sobukwe, was arrested. But they didn't go quiet. They formed their own military wing, POCO, and carried on their fight against apartheid underground. All right, time for a deep dive into one of the most iconic figures in the fight against apartheid, Nelson Mandela, and his pivotal role in creating and leading Umkonto We Sizwe, also known as MK. MK, which translates to Spear of the Nation, was the military wing of the African National Congress, or ANC. As we have already discussed, the 1960 was a game changer in South Africa. The Sharpeville massacre had just happened. The ANC and PAC were banned, and the struggle against apartheid entered a new, more intense phase. Mandela was one of those who realized that peaceful protests and passive resistance weren't cutting it anymore. They needed a new plan. And so, in 1961, MK was born, with Mandela as one of its co-founders and its first commander-in-chief. Mandela was originally all about non-violent resistance, but the brutalities of the apartheid regime, including the Sharpeville massacre, forced him to change his tune. He began to see that armed action was a necessary tool to dismantle apartheid. So the formation of MK was kind of a turning point in the anti-apartheid movement, marking a shift from peaceful protest to armed resistance. As the leader of MK, Mandela had a big job on his hands. He was in charge of organizing guerrilla warfare tactics and sabotage campaigns. Under his leadership, MK kicked off a sabotage campaign against government and economic installations, aiming to pile on the pressure while minimizing loss of life. Mandela was adamant that MK should focus on sabotage and guerrilla warfare, not terrorism, and he did his best to avoid civilian casualties. But all this activity eventually caught up with Mandela. His involvement with MK led to his arrest in 1962 and landed him in the middle of the notorious Rivonia trial from 1963 to 1964. In the trial, he made a famous speech where he acknowledged his role in MK and defended the decision to use violence as a form of political resistance. And for that, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. But as we all know, that wasn't the end of Mandela's story, not by a long shot. Thank you for listening to the History Files podcast, and we hope you found this first look into South Africa's struggle against apartheid enlightening. Welcome to another Deep Dive with History Files. This is our second installment for a comprehensive look at the apartheid era in South Africa, with a special emphasis on the more intricate facets like Bantustans, South Africa's dance of diplomacy, or lack thereof with neighboring African countries, and finally, the reaction of the international community. Apartheid, which translates to apartness went beyond racial segregation. For nearly half a century from 1948 to the early 1990s, it dictated and disrupted countless lives, sowing seeds of division 
and resentment. At the forefront of this force was the South African police. The police, especially the notorious Special Branch, didn't just uphold the law. They actively participated in enforcing racial segregation. From policing pass laws, where black individuals were regularly detained for not having the right documents, to brutally suppressing protests, the SAP was omnipresent and omnipotent. But the repression didn't stop at routine policing. The SAP also had specialized units, including the riot unit, which was trained specifically to suppress uprisings and protests. Their methods, often violent. Rubber bullets, tear gas and batons were commonplace and lethal force was not uncommon. A particularly dark chapter in this narrative is the covert operations spearheaded by the state. In the shadows, the South African government had units operating undercover, targeting anti-apartheid activists. Many activists were harassed, detained without trial, tortured, and, in some unfortunate cases, even assassinated. One of the most covert, and arguably the most feared among these, was the Civil Cooperation Bureau, an off-the-books unit of the South African Defence Force. The CCB was responsible for eliminating anti-apartheid activists both within and outside the borders of South Africa. Speaking of the Defence Force, the military played its part too. While their primary function wasn't internal control, as apartheid grew unpopular globally and resistance increased locally, they were often deployed internally. The military was frequently used in townships to quell protests, often resulting in high civilian casualties. Outside the borders, the South African Defence Force often carried out raids in neighbouring countries, targeting what they believed were ANC bases. These operations not only strained relations with neighbouring states, but also terrorised civilians in the region. Beyond the physical violence, the psychological warfare was immense. The mere presence of armoured vehicles, frequent roadblocks and midnight raids created an atmosphere of perpetual fear. Moreover, a vast network of informers meant no one knew whom to trust. Now, for those unfamiliar with the term, let's unravel the mystery of Bantustans. Picture this, territories designed specifically for black South Africans. Sounds like a gesture of goodwill. Unfortunately, that was far from the truth. These Bantustans, often located in remote or less fertile regions, were part of a strategic plan to concentrate black South Africans into designated areas. This allowed the apartheid government to claim that black citizens had their own territories and to strip them of South African citizenship. The intent? To render the rest of South Africa white. A couple of these Bantustans, like Transki and Bophuthatswana, were declared independent. However, this independence was a facade. Internationally, they remained unrecognized, isolated, and dependent on South Africa for economic survival. Zooming out from the internal structure, let's discuss South Africa's stance with its African neighbors during this period. Given its policies, it's hardly surprising that South Africa was the black sheep in the African family. Many African countries were vehemently anti-apartheid, offering refuge to activists, supporting resistance movements like the ANC, and imposing sanctions on South Africa. The Organization of African Unity, the precursor to the African Union, was particularly vocal in its criticism. However, South Africa, with its military might, wasn't one to stay quiet. The country frequently launched attacks into neighboring states, especially those believed to be housing ANC activists or bases. This aggressive stance made South Africa a pariah, often at odds with its neighbors. We've discussed the internal dynamics of apartheid and how South Africa's neighbors reacted. Now, it's essential to understand that apartheid didn't just make waves in Africa, it sent ripples across oceans, 
stirring responses from nations far and wide. The 1960s marked the beginning of heightened global attention, especially after the tragic Sharpeville massacre, where 69 protesters were killed. This brutal act was a chilling reminder of the regime's ruthlessness. With growing awareness, the international community gradually started to distance itself. The United Nations, for one, was quite vocal. In 1973, the General Assembly adopted the International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, defining it as a crime against humanity. And let's not forget the countless UN resolutions condemning the apartheid system. Sporting boycotts also played a significant role. South Africa, with its rich sports culture, especially in rugby and cricket, faced isolation. The country was barred from the Olympics from 1964 to 1988, and many nations refused to play against South African teams. Another critical aspect was the economic front. With international pressure mounting, many countries and global corporations began to divest from South Africa or impose sanctions. While debates continue about the efficacy of these sanctions, there's no denying the symbolic significance and the pressure they placed on the apartheid regime. Artists, musicians and writers from around the world also united against apartheid. Songs like Sun City by artists united against apartheid or Baiko by Peter Gabriel resonated globally, further educating the masses and spotlighting the cruelties of the system. However, it's crucial to acknowledge that the international response wasn't uniform. Some nations, particularly during the Cold War era, were reluctant to sever ties completely, seeing South Africa as a bulwark against communism in the region. As the 1980s rolled on, global anti-apartheid sentiment intensified. Rallies, protests and campaigns, particularly in places like the United Kingdom and the United States, showcased the world's solidarity with black South Africans. This global movement, combined with relentless internal resistance, eventually contributed to the system's downfall. By the early 1990s, apartheid's walls began to crumble, culminating in the historic 1994 elections, where Nelson Mandela, once an imprisoned freedom fighter, took the oath as South Africa's first black president. Thank you for tuning into this second installment of the South Africa Apartheid series. Hello everyone, and welcome back to History Files, the podcast that dives deep into the annals of history to bring you the facts, stories, and insights that you won't find in your average textbook. Today, we're embarking on a three-part episode to explain the end of apartheid in South Africa. The system of apartheid, instituted in South Africa in 1948, was a form of racial segregation that involved political, legal, and economic discrimination against non-whites. But the question we're tackling today is, what led to its dismantling? What were the political, economic, and social factors that contributed to the fall of one of the most oppressive regimes of the 20th century? First up, the political landscape. It's important to mention the role of international pressure, including sanctions and embargoes, countries around the world, especially those in the West, began isolating South Africa. By the late 1980s, it was becoming clear that the international community's patience had run out. Within South Africa, the anti-apartheid movements, most notably led by the African National Congress, or ANC, were gaining momentum despite government crackdowns. The release of Nelson Mandela in 1990, after 27 years in prison, was both a symbol and a catalyst for change. Next, let's talk 
economics. Sanctions had a dual effect. They not only isolated South Africa, but also crippled its economy. The economic downturn led to increased unrest and dissatisfaction among both blacks and whites. Unemployment was rising, and the economy was struggling to stay afloat. In this unstable economic condition, the costs of maintaining apartheid through police action, military force, and administrative overhead became unsustainable. Lastly, we cannot overlook the social factors. The anti-apartheid resistance wasn't just a political movement, it was a social upheaval. People around the globe were increasingly educated about the atrocities of apartheid through the media. Activists and everyday people began to understand that their fight was interconnected with other struggles against injustice worldwide. Internally, civil disobedience, protests and strikes made it harder for the apartheid regime to maintain its system. The social fabric of apartheid was tearing at the seams. So to sum it up, it wasn't just one thing that led to the end of apartheid. It was a complex interplay of political, economic and social factors, each intensifying the weaknesses of the apartheid system until it finally collapsed. We are now moving into section two, where we will consider the international factors that contributed to the end of apartheid. Just how did the world respond to South Africa's oppressive regime? And how did this global pressure play a role in ending apartheid? One of the most significant international pressures came in the form of economic sanctions and trade embargoes. Countries such as the United States and the United Kingdom imposed strict sanctions that significantly weakened the South African economy. The goal was clear to make apartheid so costly for the South African government that it would have no choice but to dismantle it. South Africa was increasingly isolated diplomatically. It was expelled from organizations like the United Nations and saw its leaders shunned on the world stage. This diplomatic ostracization sent a clear message. Apartheid was not acceptable in the modern world. Public opinion worldwide was turning against apartheid. Grassroots activism, especially in Western countries, was instrumental in urging governments to take actions like imposing sanctions. College campuses saw divestment campaigns, artists boycotted South Africa, and ordinary citizens took to the streets in protest. The media played an enormous role in broadcasting the realities of apartheid to the world. The images of brutality, protests, and resistance touched hearts globally, and international awareness made it increasingly difficult for the apartheid government to justify its actions. The ANC and other anti-apartheid movements received financial, moral, and strategic support from international actors. In countries like Sweden, churches and non-governmental organizations provided resources that helped sustain the resistance against apartheid. As we can see by now, pressure on multiple fronts helped push South Africa towards a more equitable future. But as we will see in Section 3, democracy was not accepted overnight. The most symbolic moment of the transition was undoubtedly the release of Nelson Mandela from Victor Versta prison on February 11, 1990. His release wasn't just an end to his 27 years of imprisonment, it was a strong signal that the apartheid era was coming to an end. Following Mandela's release, the ANC and the ruling National Party entered a period of intense negotiations. The process was fraught with tension, often spilling over into violence on the streets but it culminated in the end of apartheid and the drafting of a new constitution. Let's talk about the National Party first. They were caught in a tough position. The economic and social pressures had made the status quo untenable. Yet any move toward ending apartheid would alienate a significant portion of their voter base who were ardent supporters of the system. Moreover, they had to contend with the fear that ending apartheid could lead to 
retaliatory actions against the white population, and they had to find a way to protect minority rights in a majority rule system. The ANC had its challenges as well. They needed to ensure that the end of apartheid would lead to meaningful change, which meant negotiating for substantial political and economic reforms. They also had to manage the expectations of millions of black South Africans hungry for immediate change. Internally, the ANC was a coalition of various groups with different ideologies, from communists to nationalists. Maintaining cohesion among these groups while negotiating with the National Party was no easy feat. All these challenges came to a head in the 1994 general elections, the first in which citizens of all races could participate. Mandela's victory marked the official end of apartheid and the beginning of a new democratic South Africa. In summary, the transition to democracy and Nelson Mandela's leadership was a complex and challenging process that involved the concerted efforts of individuals, parties and international actors. The challenges faced by both the National Party and the ANC remind us that monumental change is really straightforward. And that's a wrap on our episode on the end of apartheid in South Africa. We hope this deep dive has given you a newfound understanding of this complex transformative period.